Welcome back to the second half of downloadable content, our special PAX recap. We're all still here, including Jen, who is still in the land of the text. Moving on, we go into day two. Um, having come out of about six hours of sleep. Sorry. Actually, I'm not sorry at all. <laughs> no, you're not. You're absolutely not. Everyone had set their cell phones except me. <laughs> because I knew I'd be awake to 85 different alarm tunes. Regardless, after some, some grogginess, we headed down for day two. Uh, and this, in the second day, I spent most of the day at the tabletop. I spent most of the day there um, just looking, watching. Um, I did spend a little bit of time in the console free play, but I, um, on day two I actually made it to the classic console room uh, for the first time and was instantly taken back to age five where I'm seeing one TV playing uh, Sonic the Hedgehog 2, the two-player racing. Another screen I see Rainbow Road from the original Mario Kart. Somebody's playing Punch-Out! Uh, a couple of TVs had the N64, the original Super Smash Brothers, going. And I just felt quite at home. I went, ah, uh, simple times. Without uh, unlocking an achievement every four seconds. You have found it. You've gotten a trophy. <laughs> I also noticed during the day's observations that large crowds will gather just at the merest prospect that they could possibly get something for free. Isn't that human, though? Yes, but I didn't expect it to, to take on this large capacity. Um, I'll give you an example. There was a raffle at the Bioshock booth, um, the Bioshock Infinite booth. They were raffling off three signed replica splicer masks. And they were giving out raffle tickets in the morning, and they were going to have the raffle at noon. By 11 in the morning, there was already this giant, you know, mob. And I'm like, holy hell. <laughs> you're going to, I mean, I'm, you mean to tell me that you're going to stand there for an hour doing nothing for the tiniest, you know, I mean, I could see, you know, obviously, you know, ten minutes before raffle, okay, you gotta go. But waiting there for an hour? Really? Eh. Well, something that uh, I'm gonna do for last next time that I forgot was, uh, what was great is that when we were waiting for the concerts for Pro Man and MC Fernal and the Met Metroid Metal, uh, last night that we just talked about before the break, uh, you know, as all we're good as I'll recap, but, uh, at least two people out of every ten or fifteen had a DS out, and then another one or two, you know, had sat down and were playing either the magic cards that came in the swag bag at the beginning, so much swag, or uh, you know some other game. It was just really funny. I mean, you know, gamers can wait indefinitely if you give them a distraction, and they had brought so many different distractions. So that's something I'm going to be doing. Oh yeah, I mean, I I had a feeling that was going to be the case, so I brought my my DS and my PSP. Although the PSP was kind of relegated to Facebook updates. Um, I, I never saw so many DS's in one place, ever. Ever. <laughs> you know, I know that the DS is a popular system, I know that the, I mean, the DS is the best-selling handhold, handheld console of all time, but, you know, I didn't expect every person to have one. I am like, whoa. Good on you, Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I... And I didn't see another PSP in the whole building. I, I almost was convinced that I was the only one with a PSP. <laughs> I didn't see... Even when I went into the handheld lounge at the end of the second night, d DSs. All DSs. As if, it, was if the, it was as if the PSP didn't exist. It was just like, yeah, what's that thing? <laughs> to be fair, a lot of people could have maybe... I don't know been interested in, in looking towards an NG, uh, you know, the, the next Sony release rather than just keeping their, their PSP going? Oh, well, regardless, I mean, just... And another thing that surprised me um, on this day was just... I 
honestly, you know, this is how out of, out of touch with mainstream gaming I am. I didn't think that Pokemon was still popular in our age group. <laughs> So wrong. I did not think... I thought most people our age would have outgrown it by now, but I thought I, I was dead wrong. So dead wrong. Everywhere I looked, it was just, you know... Although I did see a couple of people playing Dragon Quest on their DS, and I'm like, yes! <laughs> Good! <laughs> but then again, I, I guess you kind of had to play Pokemon with a GIANT PIKACHU! Still lording over all. Um, but, no, I didn't win any of the Bioshock Splicer masks, alas. But I did take a look at the trailer for Bioshock Infinite. I am really looking forward to that. I am really looking forward to that game. Well, I have to finish Bioshock 2 first, but... No, you don't. I don't? Well, oh. No, you don't. Oh, okay. What was it, Great Big Whale, the end? No, no, you just uh, not a Bioshock 2 fan. Okay. Well, I will find out when I play it. I enjoyed the first one. We'll see what the second one yields. You will see. Yeah, you will see. I, I will see. I also, uh, in walking around, uh, got to uh, see some of the free play areas for Rock Band and uh, Dance Central. Um, I realized that not everyone should sing. There's just some people <laughs> who just should not sing. Very, very hard to eat your lunch while listening to some guy trying to get to falsetto and they're about three notes too flat. How many spit takes, uh, you know, did it result in just, uh, trying to listen to everybody else try and sing their way through some of these songs? Oh, it, it, it was it was it was beautiful, and yet my face was contorting at the Discord. You know, being somebody who who went through music and and you know choir all through grade school and everything, just listening to these bad notes, I'm just like, it's for me hearing somebody sing out of tune kind of elicits the same effect as somebody scraping their nails on a chalkboard. Can I, uh, can, while we're on the subject of people embarrassing themselves at the show, can I just bring up something that Ian and I had discussed briefly, which was that, um... Go right the, ahead. The, the cosplay, the, the costumes that people showed up in, um, there were some, you know, there were obviously varying levels of, of, I won't even say effort, but, but of completeness on those costumes, but really there was almost nobody who showed up, uh, embarrassing themselves in a costume that they clearly could not fit into. And and I have to give people a lot of credit for that, because that's something that I could have very easily seen happening. I was I was impressed. I mean, some of the costumes were really well done. Um, and, you know, because there was, you know, because World of Warcraft and other games of that type were very much represented at this expo, um, I saw a lot of people in Ren garb, and I went, oh, I'll, and so next year I'll just come here with my Ren garb and fit right in. Just, just go, just you know, get, be all, just like, oh, I just went from one Ren fair to the convention, and you know that'll be that. Um, to be fair, that probably works the other way already too, though. Yes, you know, I mean, we saw, I saw all manners of cosplayers. There were a lot of people dressed up as video game characters. Uh, there was. Uh, I saw a few fourth doctor and tenth doctors going around. Um, I think I saw an eleventh somewhere. I, I saw a few Trekkies. You know, a lot of uh, there was quite a few uh, next generation types floating around on the floor. Uh, although, you know, again, a lot more. You know, conversation. I had a nice chat with somebody dressed up as Jill Valentine, uh, Resident Evil Three Jill, and <laughs> yes, fun to look at. Very nice, very nice girl too. Awesome stuff. The highlight of my day, though, would not come until the evening when I got to see the video game orchestra. And that, that was, was stunning. That was a, a concert that we all attended. However, before I delve into detail about VGO, uh, let's get to the Omegathon. 
We'll be here for like three hours talking about the one hour event, please. Uh, <laughs> uh, for those of you who are not familiar, the Omegathon is a contest, a an expo long contest, in which um, I guess to enter it, um, when you purchased your tickets, uh, you had to indicate whether you wanted to be in the pool to be selected for the Omegathon. I selected for you, Brian, by the way. Oh, thank you. That, uh, you almost got in, I think. That would have been funny. Um, but, you know, the Omegathon, there was 32 people, and they were divided uh, into uh, 16 teams, you know, two people, two people each team, and they had to do various, you know, gaming-like events, and the winners of said events would advance, and there were several rounds with it culminating on the final day, the closing ceremony. I didn't catch the opening rounds. I think one of the events was there, like, competitive bananagrams. Uh, that was one of them. That was one of them in the early going. But uh, what we got to see was, I think, round three. And in this case, round three was Elimination Jenga. Now, all of us were present for this, and it started off, you had, I think, it was, it was down to, I forget how many teams were left, eight, uh, eight teams? Something like that. Um, six. Six, it was down to six. Six teams of two. And it started off, they were, had to, you know, play Jenga, and the team that caused the tower to fall over would be eliminated, would be eliminated from the competition. So... I liked how it was set up. You had just a regular you had regular table with a regular Jenga tower. Then out come the guys from Penny Arcade. Who start, they're like, oh, what, what is this shit? And so, they, you know, angrily they knock over the Jenga tower, and in its place comes this life-size Jenga tower. A Jenga tower gets constructed with these huge pine blocks. It's almost as tall as a person. And then the fun begins. I never, ever thought in my wildest dreams that a game of Jenga would be so riveting. Well, it was obviously riveting because I went out after, you know, the Jenga and then the VGO contest right afterwards. I walked out to go get um, CDs and take a breather, and I was talking to some people that were in an overflow theater nearby the theater we were in. And they were all watching the Jenga too. It was uh, it was pretty impressive how the crowd was electric. It was hilarious uh, seeing you know twelve dudes play uh, twelve dudes and dudettes play uh, Jenga. It was fantastic. It was great, and you know the running commentary. I mean, the cr four thousand people could fit into that main theater. What I was told. And it was pretty full. And I just couldn't believe how electrifying it was. You know, the tense moment. You know, anytime somebody had to take out a... You know, as the tower was getting higher and higher and becoming more and more unstable. You know, anytime somebody removed a block and successfully placed it on top of the Jenga tower, the crowd roared. Absolutely roared. However... Then Omega Law came into play. Thank you, Jen, for reminding me. Um, the game was starting to drag on a bit because, you know, VGO and the rest of the Saturday evening concerts had to go on. So they incorporated what they called Omega Law, in which, you know, once you got to the tower, you had ten seconds to determine which block from the tower you were going to remove. At the end of ten seconds, uh, whatever finger... Your, whatever block your finger landed on, that was the block you had to remove. That's when things started to get interesting. <laughs> you know, the, the first person, you know, he, he, the first person who not caused the first tower to fall, and you know, he, he just kind of let, he was, he, you could see he was pissed. Because by the time the 10 seconds were up, he had landed on one of the pivotal blocks of the tower. You know, one of, one of the blocks that just simply wasn't moving, that if you removed it, it was over. So, in true fashion, he realized that he was done. So, he just took one mighty fist and just knocked the tower over. 
Like there. Take that. Well, that's that's part of the rules of the game, uh, Jen. You can only use one hand, even in regular Jenga. You can only use one hand to uh, remove and you know all that other fun stuff. But I had, it was just amazingly riveting. And then after the Jenga was over, VGO came on. <laughs> oh, I was in heaven. I was in such heaven then. And it wasn't even the full orchestra. It was, uh, I think if they said it was like 13 people out of, out of 70. Out of 77, wasn't it? Yeah, they only had a fraction of what they normally carry around, but it was still enough. Definitely more than enough. They, they opened with a Street Fighter 2 medley, which immediately got the crowd going. Uh, they did a Zelda... I know that some of the things I can remember. They did a Zelda medley. They did a theme from Castlevania. They actually played the theme from Chrono Trigger. Um, they also did the intro to Chrono Cross. Uh, also the theme for this particular show. Uh, they did a Final Fantasy suite. Um, they also did the theme from Halo, which I had never listened to. It had a beautiful cello solo. Which I thought was just absolutely exquisite. They did a few more. They did a few more things. Ian and I were commenting about how we thought the keyboard player must have injected something. She was... or I mean, you know, he was really just uh <laughs> kind of all over the place and you could tell there was a lot of a lot of talent there i mean across the board there was there was a lot of talent but the keyboardist specifically i mean you know the the hands just just ran across the keyboard like you know they could have landed on any specific key and they might have well as been like the 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 correct key it's like you know i i've never seen such well, such jittery hands and such um, skillful playing, uh, and I've I've been to quite a few concerts that that involve uh, keyboards. So like I'm, you know, I really have to say, you know, props props to them for for being able to uh, to really just spot on get all the little nuances that are normally found in those MIDI sequences. I'm convinced that there were plasmids in those hands. Yeah, Adam, <laughs> Eve. Just to be able to just blur all over the keyboard. Um, just as um, a note, they are doing a big concert at Symphony Hall in Boston on April 1st. Uh, one of the special guests will be Yasunori Mitsuda, of which I am thoroughly seething with jealousy, because I will not be able to make this concert. Uh, Mitsuda, for those of you who don't know, was responsible for the scores to games like Chrono Trigger, Chrono Cross, uh, Xeno Gears, Xenosaga Episode 1, just to, just to name a few. Jen is saying, uh, she, ha she enjoyed Zelda, the Zelda medley that they did, the, uh, the selections from Ocarina of Time. And they closed. Their encore was Metal Gear Solid 3, in which they also incorporated the song Snake Eater with a beautiful, beautiful alto sax. Yeah, that so, sounded phenomenal. I mean, it was it was great. Ben, you saw it. It was, you know, and you know, being the giant Metal Gear Solid fan that you are, Oh, I, oh my God! That was that was just that was something. I mean, to to hear that and um, oh man, it was that was just so well done. It was a little bit of a different uh, flavor from the song because there isn't normally you know the saxophone or or um, you know the strings is quite so prominent and quite that octave. But it was really beautifully done and it was it was just a fantastic effort from the orchestra. It was an awesome arrangement. Some of the things they they modified, uh, for example, at the end of. Time Scar, the theme from Chrono Cross, they added, you know, it was as if they, they felt that the song was too short, so they added their own little, little little extra at the end of it, another minute or so, which I thought was very, very well done. The Final Fantasy suite, actually, uh, I, I, I'll be honest, it did bring a tear to my eye. I'll admit it. 
Attaboy. Attaboy. Well, I, 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 that is my favorite series. That's one of the hallmarks of the Final Fantasy series, is its soundtracks. You know, they're, they're performed all over the place. Uh, Uematsu has, has really done an outstanding job with the music. So it was overall very, very well done. Um, again, I wish I could see the full orchestra. They'll perform April 1st, Symphony Hall in Boston. Tickets are available. The concerts that took place after VGO uh, were Paul and Storm and Jonathan Colton. Anyone, uh, anyone mm. of us were there for that? Uh, I was not. Um, I was not either. I know that out of all of us, I believe it was Jack who stuck around to see all of them. I know I, afterwards I went downstairs to get VGO signed, and then I took off to because uh, I didn't get a lot of time in the console free play room on the first day, and I wanted to go back there, so I went there and I went to tabletop. But Jack stayed around. And he loved Paul and Storm, uh, and he actually ended up like out of all the CDs, he bought them, and he said that they were his favorite band. And then he stayed on for Jonathan Colton, which I am sad I missed because I wanted to hear Still Alive yet again. I only heard the best things about those two concerts. It was... I did catch part of uh, the Jonathan Colton concert because they were playing it on some of the TVs um, on the second floor near the food court. After VGO, I had gone down uh, you know, to get dinner. Yeah, 11.30 at night, dinner. Uh, and yes, as a side, trying to eat something healthy at this convention was just not happening. Or cheaply. Yes, a, che- a cheeseburger, fries, and a Pepsi uh, ran 12 bucks. Is it sad that when Ian and I went for lunch one day and the total amount came to $14 for two sandwiches, two sodas, and a candy bar, we looked at each other and said, okay, she clearly missed at least two things on this menu? Yes. Yes. I'm like, 14 bucks. that's you know pretty average. That's normal. But, you know, three bucks for a soda? <laughs> we couldn't fi- – we knew she had missed something, so – Three bucks for a soda. I almost felt like I was at Yankee Stadium, but don't be silly. It would have been four fifty. Yeah, that's 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 true. But um, I did catch some of the Jonathan Colton on the screens because they were actually broadcasting it live uh, throughout. I was impressed. I'm, I'm, I wasn't. I'm, you know, I'm not a, a fan of his, but it was nice. It was it was better than uh, the rock band going on nearby. You know, now we're approaching midnight. Now we're really out of tune. <laughs> and as Wyatt was uh, doing whatever, I think he was in the console free play. I after dinner, I actually went and got my VGO T-shirt signed by all of the members of the group that were there. So that's a priceless relic I'm keeping. The CD is is awesome though, eight tracks, uh, but all of them good, all of them great. If you weren't at PAX, good luck getting it. It was a it was a PAX exclusive, actually. They said that. Um, as I think the final hour of the day for me, I had wandered over into the handheld lounge, which by one a.m. had become the sleepy time lounge. Hmm. There were the, just along the walls were just these giant bean bags, huge tracks of bean bag, and. I saw more people just sleeping on them, you know, draped, you know, bit curled up. And there were some people playing. I, I spent some time playing Dragon Quest, and as it was getting on, you know, near closing time, I, I dragged myself. I said, "All right, home. Let's go. I'm tired." And then I went, "Oh crap! Lazy. Daylight savings time." <laughs> and then suddenly it went from 1:59 a.m. to 3 a.m. It was good times. And you know, I think that that really put a cap on the second day. It, it was, yeah. it was very nice. It was, you know, the, the VGO was the one thing I wanted to see the most from the whole convention, and I got it. So, I mean, it didn't let down either. You know, like a lot of us went there. You know, you could have gone there specifically just for them, and I got to say, like, it was well worth the price of admission just for that. So, you know, props to them, man. Ah, uh, moving on to day three, the final day. Twenty-four hours remain. 
Not the moon. Oh. Uh, uh, I look up and there's this giant smiling moon. No. Uh, I noticed immediately getting in on Sunday that it wasn't going to be as packed as it had been on Friday and Saturday. For one, I could actually move freely on the expo floor. I actually had a little bit of the opposite experience at times because a lot of the um, computer parts sellers had raffles setting up. So I know um, they were setting up raffles to sell, you know, really great computer cases or parts. Or there was a great uh, drawing tablet that Alton really wanted. And uh, every so often I would try to wander around the expo floor on the third day. And all of a sudden just it would come to a standstill. I'd be stuck in a corner going, what the heck's going on? I'd look up and i see there's a crowd of people all holding up tickets waiting for them to be called out. So... There was a lot of people that last day, like, running around trying to grab some free swag, which was, uh, I mean, fun. that's the day that Jack spent five hours on the Star Wars Old Republic line saying that I was awesome. Yeah, that that basically was the theme of Sunday, wasn't it? It was just free shit day. It was, you know, I had cl- specifically emptied out my, my messenger bag, you know, because you had, you had warned us that we were going to be getting free stuff everywhere, and y- you were right. Um... I had made it over to the Bioshock booth again for the for the next daily raffle. Um, again, didn't win the, uh, the replica splicer masks, but uh, they had an extra. They were also raffling off a signed Bioshock artwork poster. Uh, by signed, I mean it was signed by Ken Levine. That's gonna be valuable one day. The person, ne- the person next to me won it. Ah. I should have just bum rushed him right there. <laughs> no, it was it was really good the third day. I mean, I I had spent most of my time. I actually didn't do a lot of console free play. I didn't do a lot of um, and even I didn't even touch the uh, the classic console, which I kind of regret. Then I still didn't get around to playing Dragon's Lair, which which drove me crazy from last year. Wah, wah, but uh, wah. yeah, but I went back to the expo floor and just you know the atmosphere and the energy in it. Um, Something that I had forgotten to uh, mention on the first day, I, I actually ran into Jerry, you know, one of the two from uh, Penny Arcade, and I wanted to run into the other guy, uh, Mike, and I just wanted to uh, talk to him because I got this great small conversation with Jerry about community and the fact that he, you know, building a community in the gaming culture. And that's what I loved about it, was just being around all the people having a good time. I know I spent the end of the second day um, playing the Dungeons & Dragons board game with four people I never met before, just sitting down and hanging out. And the third day, I tried to get in as much of that as possible, and it it happened. It was great. It it was great. I'm still bumming out that the guy next to me won the Bioshock post. I should have just had Ian be like, look, you distract him. And <laughs> you have lost karma. Yeah, you distract him, and then you know I'll just I'll come in and and you know pull a you know pull a cheap Halo move and hit him from behind. <laughs> you know, thunk. Just, ooh, grab his stuff. Gravity but, hammer. Yeah, but no. I took advantage of the fact that it wasn't as packed. There was a momentary lapse in the Mortal Kombat line. It was actually short enough for me to go. Oh, it'll only be a few minutes to wait, and so I did. Good thing, too, because it quickly filled up again. I finally got some hands-on with the new Mortal Kombat game. (laughs) Pure, unadulterated, bloody bliss. I cannot wait for this game to come out. I'm so glad it's going back to the 2D plane. It should never have left the 2D plane, but it did... And now it's crawling back, hoping that'll be forgiven. That was enjoyable. I also spent a good chunk of time just wandering around the expo floor getting, you know, free shit. Um, I took a picture with somebody in one of the N- in the NVIDIA booth. Um, it's now floating around on their website. I look like I'm being uh, beheaded. In, in glorious 3D. Um, let's see, what else do I recall from the third day? Um, the third day was the shortest of the three. It, uh, the convention closed at 7 in the evening instead of its usual 2 in, in the morning. Uh, it closed with the final event of the Omegathon. The last... That was a freaking treat. Oh, uh, uh, Yeah. The final event, it was down to two teams. 
Uh, one of them would go on to the game show in Germany later on this year. That was the prize for winning the Omegathon. So the final yeah. event was Ikaruga. The build-up was fantastic to this, where um, you know they had the final countdown playing, and you had uh, Jerry and Mike run out on stage, and you know they called up the Omega Knots, and you know a lot, a lot of jokes abounded, and then you just hear them say, "Okay, we finally picked the most uh, probably visually stimulating uh, game that we've ever had." You know, lots of color, lots of black and white. You might even call it racist, and it was from the Dreamcast. That's a paraphrase, not an exact quotation. I remember thinking, "Oh dear, if this is what I think it is," and also you hear that opening sound that. I hope you hear uh, the you hear the opening track for Ikaruga, <laughs> and the crowd goes freaking nuts. Um, on either side of the stage, you had about I'm going to say I don't know 20 foot, 30 foot screens, and they start they start they start showing Ikaruga in action, and everyone just you know the entire place went went crazy, and it was great to watch. It was a great way to end this over dramatic, this fantastic weekend of just gaming everywhere so much to end with this you know ridiculous game that even Jerry and Mike were just saying this is this 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 game you know is amazing so it was awesome to to be more specific what they had to do in Ikaruga they the 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 teams it was a score attack uh, they were playing the first two levels of the game and it was exactly that a highest score wins and for those of you who have played Ikaruga if not download episode 4 of downloadable content and find out about it. Hint, hint, fucking hint. Awesome, awesome game. You know, the way, you know, a lot of ways, if you're playing the game strictly for high score, um, the key is to uh, link chains. And eat as many bullets as possible. It was very, very exciting very, very riveting. Um, then the the team that won, I think, was the the one left that was consist of one guy, one girl on the team. You, you, you almost you like you know maybe these guys have played before. I just didn't think that many people heard of Ikaruga, except maybe for the five of us who were the four or five of us on the last episode. But uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful way to end packs. And, you know, overall, I think the thing that I will take away most from this weekend was, again, just the whole communal experience. Mm hmm You know, really, just seeing, you know, just nerds, gamers, one and all, very nice people, you know, people you weren't afraid to just walk up to and have a conversation or a game with. That, I think, is what will stick with me the most, and, and VGO, of course. But What about you guys? I just thought the whole event well, you know, was, was um, just really a tremendous amount of fun. Um, the, the show floor was, was if anything, maybe, uh, you know, it was a phenomenal place to, to see all these things, but it was a little bit um, overwhelming at times, which was nice that you had other areas to balance it out, the, the tabletop areas, the free play console rooms, the arcades. Um, and of course, the theaters for all the panels. We didn't even really talk about any of the panels that uh, that people attended. Um, it was it was just a, a really really fun experience, all in all. Ian, what say you? Well, you know, I have to agree with with both of you. It was absolutely uh, it was very well done. Um, you know, I, it was very crowded, but you know, it was sold out. Uh, and certain days, like Saturday, sold out really early, so you knew going into this that it was going to be uh, not for the claustrophobic or faint of hearted. Um, I have to agree, the, the expo hall was a little bit um, overwhelming, just because it, it kind of became a peacock contest of, look, my screen is so big, look, my gimmick is this <laughs> huge. And, you know, nor that that's not a bad thing because, I mean, you get some really creative, nice content that way that really livens up the entire experience. However, when you um, cram all of that into um, a smaller space, and I use that word relatively because, you know, this the, the Boston Convention Center is appallingly large, um, you know, at and you uh, – football fields. At yeah, least. more or less, like – you know, you, you could li literally construct the Hindenburg inside this thing. Um, but I mean, you know, 
when you looked at the way it was it was uh, spread out, you kind of raised your eyebrows a little bit because, um, you know, you did have like these scattered food courts, and there was one uh, one specific like really enormous space that was dedicated to a very small food court. Um, and you know, I really thought that maybe they might have been able to uh, split up the expo hall, or or at least spread it out a little bit, because um, you know that's what makes it so really overwhelming at times is is the fact that you have so many bright colors and so many people and so such large TVs and such um, amazingly attractive women, and all of a sudden it, it's all there in one place, and you you kind of you know your heart just stops, and you you want to go and you want to see everything, but you always get the sense that you know have I been here before? Have I seen this? You know you don't want to miss anything, and, and sometimes that just got a little overwhelming. Uh, as far as everything else was concerned, you know the panels were awesome. I know um, Ben and I stopped by the Mega sixty four. Uh, panel which was which was hilarious you know there were several other uh panels that were that were really great the uh, the console room you know the the free play uh, areas were just you know absolutely a a great idea because i mean you know that that was the communal experience and then you took the 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 overall friendly atmosphere and the affable people and you put them together and you have them game and that's what makes gaming what it is you know that that's what makes you know uh, Xbox Live bearable and that's what makes you know things like Brawl so fun you know I don't know anybody that that prefers games like Brawl just single player that that's you know, it's a communal event, and this I think really pulled off the the community aspect of communal very very well. Yeah, um, gotta echo the you know the community is what it is, and I'm just gonna take take a moment out here to just I guess congratulate the guys at Penny Arcade. Um, the two of these guys have probably been in some ways the most successful in making a convention for gamers. Where they were, they, they they wanted to say, and I believe um, when he's when they sent out the invites, they sent out the uh, tags. They he, uh, one of them said, you know, we're trying to make PAX is our church for gaming, and uh, you know, let us let us all come together and worship. And while that is a little bit, you know, on the sacrilegious side, it's very true in the fact that um, that's what they try to do. That's what they've been trying to do. They start up the last PAX East, saying that you know, let let's all come this weekend and build a community, build a culture. And that's what's so exciting about it is that that's, that's what you get at um, PAX, I believe, is this really big feeling of kinship, of hanging out. I mean, I'm going to, at the rock band stages that were all across the place and at the Dance Central stage, it didn't matter how well or uh, how good or bad you did, uh, people still cheered and they laughed. It was, it was this amazingly friendly experience that I just, I reveled in, and I had such a great time. I mean, that's why I spent most of my third day doing, and of course, you know, things like the panels. Uh, on the second day, I got to go see a panel with Steve Jackson in it, uh, talking about paper gaming and how to break into the industry. Um, there was many panels that I just gave up on trying to get into since the lines were so damn long. But even even then, I, you know, I didn't get to go to that, I didn't get to go to 3DS, I didn't get to go to this and that, but I don't care. There was just so much to do and so much to appreciate and enjoy and experience. I can't wait for the next one. I can't wait to uh, go to the next one better prepared. Uh, probably get there on Thursday night and you know um, soak in the sleep and then stay over Sunday night so I can soak in the sleep before driving back from Boston. It was a fantastic experience. Definitely the way to go. Make sure that uh, you're not you're doing as little travel as possible on the actual days of the expo, just because you will want to be there and you will not want to leave. So just plan ahead. But be that as it may, and I, one of you just mentioned, uh, next year, hopefully, I will attend some of the panels. I didn't get to any of them. Not a one. There was a lot of them, too. There was a lot of different areas, a lot of different theaters, a lot of meeting rooms where panels, informative panels, game industry-related panels uh, were taking place. So if any of you are aspiring to be game developers or what have you, uh, these panels probably provided some very, very important information. I hope to catch more of that next time. Now that I know what to expect, 
now you know I'll, I'll be better better prepared for it this time uh, next time around. By then, uh, Duke Nukem Forever will be out. <laughs> <laughs> Red, wow, that's, a, that's a weird sentence Don't to say, that. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that booth that booth was ridiculous. Um, Gaming's biggest laughing stock is is uh, had a booth, so. Well, it's not the first time it's had a booth. It's just it's the first time in a long time that it's had a booth, and people actually thought they might legitimately be playing the game by the end of the year. Oh, before I forget, Jen's been uh, talking a lot. She says that you know it was it was her first convention that she's been to, and even though that she's not much of a gamer, she's just kind of being sucked into the gamer culture. Um, we will I guess, blame I, you. I guess you can blame me, uh, which is bad because when her sister finds out, she's going to kill me. But. Uh, <laughs> She said it was over. She said it was overwhelming, but she just she enjoyed it, and she has no regrets about it. Even the money spent, which is a lot for you know being in college. So, it was great. All righty, so there you go, everyone. Our experiences for from the weekend that was. However, now we open the floor to you. Downloadable content has its own Facebook. When this episode, once you hear this episode, I should say, feel free to go on to Downloadable Contents Facebook and give us your own PAX experiences. You know, what you liked, what you didn't like. We'll, we'll listen to it. We'll see it. Hell, we'll, we may even reply to it. On that happy note, thank you, Ben, Ian, Wyatt, and Jen from the Land of Text for joining me on this very fine, sophisticated program. And, uh... Last thing I want to say is, uh... Damn your car, Wyatt, for going 90 miles an hour on the Mass Pike and still getting 100 miles to the gallon. You, su you suck. I have, I have a Prius. <laughs> you suck hard. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everyone. Whatever, man. Flip the table. Good night. Screw this game. Bye.